if you can hear my voice, you might want to come in and find a seat. We're going to get started very soon this morning. We have lots of things uh, that we get to celebrate today. And uh, lots of reasons to celebrate. The first and foremost, right, Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Um, so I invite you to stand. Let's sing about that, about God's love for us. Well, good morning. Congratulations to the class of 2021. (laughs) 
heard a great turnout yesterday, and I know a number of you went to a number of different graduate parties, and we had a great turnout here at Baccalaureate on, oh, what night was that, Wednesday? <laughs> Busy week. Uh, so thank you to those that came for that, too. We heard a lot of really great comments, and it was uh, a really big turnout for a baccalaureate planned on short notice uh, and held away from the school, and so it was a blessing to our community, and so thankful for that opportunity as well. Uh, make sure you grab the card in your bulletin and, and just let, fill that out. Let us know how we can be praying for you, if there's ways you want to get involved and, and different things like that. And then the card and offering go in the box outside of the sanctuary. Uh, highlight a few things for you in your bulletin this morning. Reminder, next week is our community church service. We're going to be out out that way. Uh, some chairs will be set up. We encourage you to bring your own. Notice a couple of things. First, that there's no Sunday school because of the community service. So along with that, the church service is at 10, not 1030. Okay, it's at 10 a.m. So if you show up at 1030, well, we'll all see you because we'll be facing that way. So uh, there's going to be um, coffee and donuts at 930. So if you want to come early and socialize and fellowship, there'll be, there'll be that opportunity at 930 and the service will start at 10. So we look forward to doing that together with our community. In two weeks, we're going to have our church business meeting. There's a number of things that are posted out there. Uh, for you that we'll be voting on. And you, if you want to know what those are, you can go uh, look at them. They're posted on the bulletin board. So please plan to stay in two weeks uh, for a, our business meeting. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I mentioned that we're going to do a men's getaway July 9th through 11th. So that's like four weeks away now. Um, and so if you men are interested in that, we were going to do this last fall, and then we had to cancel it because of the fires and the smoke. Uh, so we're going to try again July 9th through 11th. Uh, please let us know. Probably like in two weeks, we'd like to try to get pretty good numbers so Josh can plan accordingly for food. Uh, and so we're asking for um, a cost of $60 for that to cover the food and then a little bit for the cost of the campsites as well. So, of course, if, that's, if money's an issue, please let us know because we want everyone to be able to go that wants to go. Um, so please let me or Pastor Michael know in, in the next couple weeks if you'd like to go. We'd love to have you. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to honor our seniors this morning. And so we'll invite Amanda and Micah and Abby to come up front, their favorite thing. It... it um, it probably gets a little harder every year because every year I'm here a little longer and I've had a little bit more time with them. And so these guys would have been in eighth grade when I first arrived. Uh, and so five years with them. I was starting to think the other day, who would have been my very first group of kids that I've had all the way through? But that's a couple more years yet. But eighth, my first eighth graders uh, and all the way through. And, and this is, well, I guess every group is a special group, but it's always... It feels like a special group of, of kids. I mean, Micah, um, Micah's been a consistent through the years. I remember a couple years ago when he asked me if I wanted to be a senior pastor someday. And I, I said, no, are you afraid I want your dad's job or something like that? <laughs> said, I like where I'm at. I, I don't think I want to preach every week. And then he said, okay, well, then I'll, I'll be your boss someday and I'll take the senior pastor job. But <laughs> I'm not sure if that's still what he's thinking, but... <laughs> Look, they're happy that you want to be my boss. <laughs> they, oh, maybe that's what, <laughs> Sorry, Michael. <laughs> uh, and, and Abby, Abby and Anna, too, well, together, because that's how I met them. But they're some of, like, my earliest memories. They're the first, one of the first youth kids I knew when I came here. And they had me convinced at first that they were cousins. I don't remember how long that lasted, but... So I still think of them as cousins just because, but... And they're always a blessing because they just are, I don't know, always just think of so fun. Like they're just always in good spirits and make me laugh and have good attitudes and know how to be goofy and silly. And I just enjoy, have enjoyed that about Abby over the years. And, and then Amanda as well, who wasn't really involved when I first got here. And so it's been cool to watch God work in her heart and draw her in. And then she started attending and now 
really, now she's my only senior left still attending youth group. So uh, just to watch her faithfulness and God change her heart through the trip to Mexico and, and uh, to have all of them and just have the years t- together with them has been a blessing to me. And I know that you've been a huge blessing in their lives as well. And so uh, just briefly, we'll ask them first, what's next? So if, you're, if it's college, you can also let us know maybe what you're studying. And then, uh, and then I'll ask them how we can pray for them, how you can pray for them specifically. So first, why don't you just tell us what's next? Uh, so in the fall, I'm going to be going to Lynn Benton Community College. And I'm just going to be taking my required classes that I have to do because I'm not sure what I really want to do next. So once I get those out of the way, then I'm planning on going to a four-year university or something to f- figure out what I want to do. I don't know. I'm just going to work for the summer because I don't really know what to do. <laughs> uh, I'm going to Western Oregon University, and I don't know what I'm studying yet. Hopefully you figure out before you go to school what you want to do. Don't go to school to figure out. Well, I guess it all comes together. <laughs> I've known some professional college students over the year, years, but that gets expensive. No, we, we trust that the Lord will lead you, and I know that it can be challenging to know what's next. And uh, so definitely, sounds like all three of you are not sure, so that's definitely a way we can be praying. And I remember similar things at that age. It's hard to know what the future holds, and so we can be praying for you guys as you decide what's next. So then also specifically, what other ways can we pray for you? I mean, pretty much what you just said, just like <laughs> pray that I'll know what I want to do in the future and yeah, that I'll have the strength to do it. So. Um, pretty much the same thing, just for like direction in my life. Um, keeping grades up while I'm learning how to function as a human on my own would be good. So. Awesome. And so... Uh, On behalf of the church, we have a couple of gifts for you. I do want to mention, if you didn't sign their Bibles, you'll have to get it from them because I'm giving them to them. But there's also the other four still for seniors that come to youth group uh, that we want to bless them with a Bible from you guys as well. So make sure you sign those because I'll give that to them tonight. But... Uh, so first, we have, we, have, we have these nice, easy travel Bibles that we expect you to take with you everywhere. No, I'm kidding. We just want to... We know that... Um, we got nice study Bibles, so you have a way with good notes on the bottom of ways to be able to dig deeper when you want to study God's Word. And so, Amanda, there's one for you. And you'll have to grab your box, because I think people are putting cards in your boxes out there, too, so make sure you guys grab those. And Micah, and Abby. And so then we'll also invite your moms to come bring you uh, the quilt that's made by a number of the ladies here from church. And so... I, as always, we'll want you to take those out and hold them up so you might have to spread out here a little bit so you can show the church family your quilts as well. And, and maybe someone wants to take a picture of that as well this morning, but go ahead and open those. which ladies were involved in these, but a huge thank you to you guys because I know that takes a lot of hours of work um, and we appreciate all the time that you have put into making those. Michael says I'm to have you stand up. So even if you don't want to, I guess, ladies, if you were involved in making these quilts, please stand up this morning so we can thank you for that. So these young men, young men and ladies can thank you as well. <laughs> uh, so... Why don't I have dads come and join too, Michael and Josh, and I'm going to pray for our seniors this morning, and um, I guess I wasn't planning to do that, but that'll, that'll work well to have your parents just be with you as we pray for you this morning, and, um, and yeah, just send you guys off, and so we're thankful to have had you as part of our church family and look forward to seeing where God takes you in the future, so... Um, Lord, thank you for this chance this morning to honor our seniors, these uh, three special young people that have worked hard to finish off their high school years. 
Uh, they've been a part of this church family for a number of years and uh, so thankful for a church family that loves and cares about its young people and invests into them. Uh, Lord, and as they take the step into what's next, that can often be uh, scary and f a feeling of uncertainness. Uh, certainly we heard that this morning of all three of them having plans but not necessarily sure what, um, what their long term looks like, Lord. And so guide them in, in their in their futures as they plan that, Lord, as they figure out where you're calling them, Lord, that they would have a sense of purpose from you, uh, that they would know what their gifting is of how you've designed them and how you want to use them, where you want to call them. Lord, we also know that um, right where they're going now, just to L LB or just to work or uh, Western Oregon, Lord, that's where you've called them right now. And they can be your servants there as well, Lord. Um, and so pray that they would see opportunities to live out the gospel, to live out their walk with you. Lord, that they would see that as their area of ministry uh, right now uh, and not just uh, worry about the future and what, what your plans are, but to recognize that you have plans for them today, tomorrow, right now, Lord. Uh, thank you so much for the years that I've had with them for the, for the joy that they brought me, for the conversations that we've had, for the laughter we've had together, for the questions that have been asked, for the growth that they've had, Lord. We pray that they would continue to know you, that they would stand firm on the truth of your word. Uh, the Bibles that they're holding in your hands, Lord, would be a source of hope and encouragement and joy and strength, Lord, that they would know um, that that's truth for their lives, Lord. And so as they wrestle with life and questions and doubts and fears and, and everything that, the ups and downs of what we face, uh, certainly uh, tense political climate and other things, Lord, that they would go to your word for answers, Lord, that they would go to you, that their relationship with you would just be solidified in the coming months. And they would recognize that what they've been taught their life, their whole life, Lord, is true and that their passion and their love for you would just grow. Lord, we look forward to uh, rejoicing in the ways that you work in them and bring yourself glory as you work through them, Lord. Uh, we love them. Pray that they know that they're loved and that you love them, uh, Lord. And we, yeah, we're excited to see what you do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right, I think we have special music at this point in time.
of singing. Um, I think it's good to be reminded that we have much um, to praise God for. Uh, this week I was reminded that, you know, we were his enemies. We had nothing to offer, and yet he gave us everything. Um, Um, Let's think about this through some verses we have here. As it is written, none is, none is righteousness, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Let's stand and sing about that.
saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we had done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Follow the Lord your God and fear him. You must keep his commands and listen to his voice. You must worship him and remain faithful to him. See 
Father God, that is the prayer of our hearts, that you would speak to us through your word. Today, God, we praise you that though we were separated from you by your sin because of your great grace and your mercy, you brought us into your family. God, open the eyes of our hearts that we may hear from you today, that we may um, walk in obedience to what we hear. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, amen. Good morning. It's been a, been a special Sunday already, hasn't it? It's uh, great to be together to worship the Lord. If you would please turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy 13 is where we're going to be today. It has been a special uh, week, a great week for us in, in our house, of course. A uh, blessing to have Molly and Santiago here and Caleb's back. And so the rare occasion of all the beach kids are in the same house at the same time, at least for a couple more days. And my parents being here too has been a great blessing. So I thoroughly enjoyed graduation yesterday. Um, there was one graduation cap yesterday that stood above all of the rest, and maybe Elizabeth, Elizabeth can hold it up for you here, so I know Bob especially liked it, but um, yeah. <laughs> I, could, I could pick him out from a crowd because he had that special hat on. I have no idea where he got the idea to do that, but uh, anyway, I'm not sure now after hearing what Justin said if I should be concerned that Mike is angling for my job, uh, but he's becoming a pretty good little public speaker himself. So um, anyway, we want to just say thank you to everyone that's been a part of, of our family here. You've been such a blessing to us. Many of you came yesterday to, to honor Micah, and many of you were here on Wednesday for baccalaureate, and that was, that was a special thing. We were grateful for the turnout uh, from the community at that service, but also just that so many of you were here uh, to be a blessing uh, to those graduates. So thank you for being a part of that. It's interesting today we're in Deuteronomy 13 and the, the title of the message is Don't Be Enticed. And this is actually a message that could be uh, especially for our high school graduates. Of course, I already had a message for them on Wednesday, but it's for all of us here as well. So I hope that you'll all listen. But the timing of this I found rather interesting that the points that come from this passage today really... Uh, are meaningful, I think, for young people who are heading out into the world and have a lot of opportunities to be enticed to go into the wrong direction. And so that's what we're looking at today. You'll, we'll see in, in our outline, there's an outline in your bulletin that you got today, three different groups of people that Moses challenges the children of Israel to not be enticed by. And the first one is a prophet or a dreamer in verses 1 through 5. Don't be enticed by that prophet or the dreamer. Secondly, to not be enticed by family or friends. And third, not to be enticed by useless people like San Francisco Giants. No, I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> useless people. So we'll, uh, we'll see all of these. Hopefully we'll be serious as we get to these. But what this is about is the idea of not being enticed away from pure devotion to the Lord. And so the children of Israel, as I've told you numerous times now, were on the brink of entering into the promised land. They were becoming a new people that God had set apart for Himself, created a nation of people who belonged to Him, and they were preparing for that destiny that He had for them, their own land. They were on the cusp of entering into a new experience, similar to what perhaps high school graduates are, on the cusp of entering into a new stage of life. And Moses here in this section wanted to challenge the children of Israel to not be led astray from a pure and total devotion to their God that they had a relationship with. And how, how many of us realize how easy it is in the world in which we live to be enticed to go the wrong direction or to be enticed to stray from complete and total devotion to God alone. That's what Moses was concerned with here uh, with the people of Israel. 
And then as we get into this chapter, I just wanted to mention there are going to be some penalties for those that do lead the people astray or try to lead the people astray, and they seem harsh to us in our modern ears. But one writer had some helpful thoughts about why these penalties needed to be so harsh uh, for those who would try to lead the people of Israel away from true worship of God. Peter Craigie said, of all the potential crimes in ancient Israel, the one described in this chapter was the most dangerous in terms of its broader ramifications to attempt deliberately to undermine allegiance to God was the worst form of subversive activity. And that is the idea that there would be people who would purposefully try to cause the children of Israel to, uh, to stray from their devotion to this covenant relationship that they had with the God who had rescued them from slavery. And then Peter Craigie went on to say, in its implications, the crime would be equivalent to treason or espionage in time of war. So the people of Israel were called here to take very seriously this challenge to their devotion to God alone. So let's look at these three different people that we're not supposed to be enticed by. Number one, don't be enticed by a prophet or dreamer. A prophet or dreamer, chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you. He's testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice, and you shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. This prophet or this dreamer of dreams. Now the children of Israel, as we know, uh, there were prophets that spoke to them the very words of God. But here they're being warned that someone may come along who is a prophet who claims to speak for God or someone who claims to have received dreams from God. And then he says, even in verse 1 and in verse 2, even if they show signs and wonders and those, those signs and wonders come to pass, Israel's being warned that there may be people that would come along and they'll sound like they're speaking for God. And they'll even perform miraculous wonders that makes it appear like they must be speaking for God because they're able to do these miracles and they come true. And Moses says, even if someone comes along and is able to do these things, if they say, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. How easy it would have been for the children of Israel to have heard someone speak and think that they had authority, and especially if they saw them perform signs and wonders to think, wow, they must be speaking on behalf of God. But the test for them was, what is the purpose behind those signs and wonders? What is the purpose behind those prophetic statements that they're making? And if they use those great statements and those miracles to try to get you to follow after false gods, then you know that they're not from the Lord, right? Seems pretty obvious, but this would have been a very strong temptation for this new people and preparing to go into this new land. How easily they could have been enticed by someone who sounded like they had great authority and even looked like by their wonders and signs. Here they're being warned about false prophets. Even today, false prophets are still around. And even today, there are sometimes signs and wonders that seem to be done in, in religious circles. The question is, 
Are those things being done genuinely to point someone to true devotion to God through Jesus Christ? That's the test. Similar to like in the New Testament when Paul talked about the Bereans. When, when the Bereans heard even the great apostle Paul preaching to them, they were seen to be as more noble than everybody else because they searched the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul was saying was true. And we, we might think, wow, you know, you, the great apostle Paul is here speaking to us. We'll just take whatever he says, right? I mean, this is Paul. He had a reputation by this point. You know, and, and he might have even been able to perform signs and wonders as well. But the Bereans were more noble, the Bible says, because they didn't just take whatever was being fed them at face value. They checked God's Word to make sure that what the apostle was telling them was true. Israel's being told to use that same test here to pay attention to whatever it is that this prophet or this dreamer, whatever they say, does it square with what you know to be true about God? And even today we have the same dangers of religious leaders who will use their position or even use mighty works to try to get people off of the right track from worshiping the one true and living God. The Life Application Bible says false prophets are still around today. The wise person will carefully test ideas against the truth of God's Word. Against the truth of God's Word. There was a very strong warning here, and obviously you see in verse 5, very serious consequences that Moses says are here for the uh, false prophet. That that person was to be put to death. One writer I was reading this week pointed out the importance of the fact that this false prophet was calling the children of Israel to be faithless who had been redeemed by a God who was so faithful to them. These false prophets or these dreamers were trying to get Israel to worship these other gods. And remember, the land that they were going to possess that, was, uh, that they were kicking out, the Canaanites and all of those others, they were places where false gods were constantly worshipped. Uh, we saw it last week when they talked about on every high hill and under every green tree, that this false worship of, of these idols was taking place constantly, all over the place. So the temptation for Israel when they were going to enter into this new land and kick out these foreign people, the temptation would be great for them to say, well, the people who lived here before us, they worship these gods. So maybe we should too. And Moses is saying, no, if anyone tries to lead you to worship any other God but God, the one God, the one true God who rescued you out of slavery in Egypt, the one true God who showed you all those wondrous signs, He's the only one that you are to listen to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul's talking to the church and he challenges the church regarding sexual immorality that was running rampant in the church and that the people of the church were allowing to go on and not having any problems with it, not standing up to the people that were involved in it. And he challenges them to judge those who are inside the church because of their immorality. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 5.13, God judges those outside after he had told them to judge those inside the church. And then he quotes this passage, Purge the evil person from among you. So there Paul takes the same concept that Moses was using here. And Moses was saying, purge the evil from your midst. Those false prophets, those dreamers, they had to be eliminated from the people of Israel so that their connection to God, so that their worship would remain pure. And in the same way, Paul talks to the church and says people that are living lives contrary to God's Word, are not to be allowed to stay in right fellowship in the church. That you are to take someone who's in open, sinful lifestyle and remove them from the church so that the church will remain pure. It's a challenging statement, isn't it? But it's the, the importance is to recognize how serious God is about keeping His people in right relationship with Him. And by not allowing unholiness to run rampant through God's people. And so Moses here was very serious about purging the evil from their midst. Don't be enticed by a prophet, a dreamer, any kind of a religious leader who tries to take you astray from pure devotion 
to Christ. Number two, don't be enticed by family or friends. Don't be enticed by family or friends. Look at verses 6 through 11. If your brother, the son of your mother, or your son or your daughter, or the wife you embrace, or your friend who is as your own soul, entices you secretly, saying, let us go and serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known. Some of the gods of the peoples who are around you, whether near you or far off from you, from the one end of the earth to the other, you shall not yield to him, or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him, nor shall you conceal him. But you shall kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death. And afterward, the hand of all the people. You shall stone him to death with stones because he sought to draw you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And all Israel shall hear and fear and never again do any such wickedness as this among you. In this section, second section, we see repetition from the first, and that is, if this group of people or anyone from this group of people tries to say to you, let us go and serve other gods, let us go and worship other gods, that's the phrase that's repeated in the first section and in the second section, and it's also in the third. The common theme of all these different groups of people Moses is warning them against is someone who would try to lead them to worship false gods, to to cause them to go astray from pure, undivided loyalty to God. And here in this section, he's not talking about a prophet or a dreamer, a false religious teacher. Here he's actually talking about people that are close to you. He says your brother, your mother, your daughter, your son, your wife, If any of these people try to lead you astray and say, let us go and serve other gods, he says, you shall not listen to them. These were the people who would have been the closest to the children of Israel. Their family relationships were of utmost importance to them at this time in history. Of course, our family relationships are still of utmost importance to us today, right? They often in this culture live together in extended families in one large household. And so if anyone that was a part of their household was trying to lead them to worship a false god, he says you're not to listen to them. And he even says you're not even to pity them, but you're actually to put them to death. Pretty serious consequences, isn't it? He uses the phrase, your brother, the son of your mother. That's the, literally a blood brother. Or the wife you embrace. There's a pretty well-known Hebrew idiom that refers to the wife of your bosom. The ESV here talks about your friend who is, who is as your own soul. That's the idea of someone who is your closest friend. Any of these people who would have been so close to you, he says, don't listen to them if they're telling you to listen, to, to go after and serve other gods. Now, we might, that might be something that even happens today in our culture, that many people today who decide to follow after Jesus Christ will have people who are close to them try to lead them in another direction. Some of you might receive the monthly magazine from Voice of the Martyrs, which has all kinds of sometimes sad stories, but also uplifting, encouraging stories of incredible faith. And many times the stories in that magazine that talk about people all over the world in Muslim countries and in Hindu-dominated countries, people decide to follow Jesus Christ and it, and it ends up in the loss of everything that was dear to them. Uh, it talks in that magazine of a, of a wife who comes to faith in Christ and her husband will beat her and kick her out of the house. And that happens all over the world, even today. Or a a young person who decides that they believe in Jesus Christ and their parents will disown them, probably beat them as well, kick them out of the house. People who are willing to be ostracized entirely from their community, who will never have the opportunity to get a job in their community again because they've decided that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no matter what, their family says, no matter what their closest friends say, no matter what their potential employers say, they're going to live for Jesus Christ and they're not going to swerve to one way or the other. All over the world today, 
people are being enticed to leave the true faith by family, by friends, and by those who are closest to them. Here Moses says, even if someone that close to you entices you to go astray, don't listen to them. Jesus makes it clear that devotion to Him needs to become primary in our lives, priority number one in our lives, even above our relationships with our family, as important as our family is to us. And you read the Bible and you see how important family is to God. But Jesus even says, compared to your devotion, your love for me, your relationships with your family needs to come in a distant, far distant second place. Jesus Christ needs to be your number one priority. There are all kinds of people in the world today who will try to lead you astray. Proverbs 16.29 was a proverb we just read uh, this week in our one-year Bible. It says, a man of violence entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. Entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. Micah chapter 7 verse 5 says, put no trust in a neighbor, have no confidence in a friend, guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. There the the prophet Micah was even telling the children of Israel to be very careful, even from their wives, from their friends, or from their neighbors, that they would not allow any of them to lead them astray from pure devotion to God. In Proverbs chapter 1 verse 10 Solomon, speaking to his son, says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If sinners entice you, do not consent. So if it's a prophet or a dreamer of dreams trying to say, Hey, let's go serve other gods, don't listen to them. Even if it's a family member or close friends trying to say, Hey, let's go and serve other gods, don't listen to them. And then number three is useless people. Useless people. And I'll leave out the comments about the giants. Verses 12 through 18. If you hear in one of your cities which the Lord your God is giving you to dwell there, that certain worthless fellows, I like the way the ESV says that, certain worthless fellows have gone out among you and have drawn away the inhabitants of their city saying, there it is again, let us go and serve other gods which you have not known Then you shall inquire and make search and ask diligently. And behold, if it be true and certain that such an abomination has been done among you, you shall surely put the inhabitants of the city, of that city, to the sword, devoting it to destruction, all who are in it and its cattle with the edge of the sword. You shall gather all its spoil into the midst of its open square and burn the city and all its spoil with fire. As a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God, it shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. None of the devoted things, that is the things that were used in idolatry, shall stick to your hand that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of His anger and show you mercy and have compassion on you and multiply you as He swore to your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping all His commandments that I am commanding you today, and doing what is right in the sight of the Lord your God. Well, again, here's the idea that the Lord deserves and demands that His people show exclusive loyalty to Him alone. And He says, even if these useless people or worthless people come and try to lead you to worship other gods, don't listen to them. The ESV uses this term in verse 13, certain worthless fellows The actual Hebrew word is the sons of Belial. You may have heard of that. That word Belial is used in 2 Corinthians 6 where it says, what fellowship does Christ have with Belial? In that section that I've told you about many times before, 2 Corinthians 6, unbelievers and believers do not mix, where Paul tells the children of Israel to not be... uh, led astray by being in intimate relationships with people who are not believers. In that section, Paul says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? And he says, what fellowship does Christ have with Belial? That's actually the word that's used here. Um, In the New Testament, it was basically used as a synonym of Satan. 
but Belial. The different translations in the English have all kinds of different ways that they like to translate this, a bunch of different options, and so I'm just going to share some of them with you. The New Revised Standard uses the word scoundrels. That might be a better word, scoundrels. The New Living Translation uses that too. The King James Version just says the children of Belial. The CSB says wicked men. The RSV says base, base men. Uh, the, the old 1901 American Standard Version said certain base fellows, which is I think where they got the ESV one here. The New King James Version refers to them as corrupt people. The NIV uses the one I think I like the best, troublemakers. Those troublemakers come along and try to lead you astray. New American Standard says worthless, and another one refers to them as worthless men. Useless people, worthless people, troublemakers. You know, Satan has his people uh, planted all around believers trying constantly to lead us in the wrong direction. Uh, we can be led astray by the people that we hear on the television. We can be led astray by the people who are singing the songs that we listen to. We can be led astray by the people right next to us at work or in school. The people that he refers to here as these certain worthless fellows or troublemakers is anyone that would try to divert you from complete and total loyalty to God, to complete and total devotion to Christ alone. Have you ever encountered anyone like that? He says, well, why is it that you're making that decision? Oh, come on, just, you know, you know, why be such a prude? You know, come along and go ahead and just, why don't you drink this with us? It won't hurt you. Why don't you smoke this with me? It's not a big deal. Oh, why would you save yourself from marriage? What's that all about, you know? How 1950s of you. There are people like that trying to lead people astray constantly, aren't there? Especially when you turn on the TV or watch the movies or listen to people online. There's continual effort from Satan to cause people who believe in Jesus to divert from the path. That's why Jesus said the, the path to eternal life is a narrow path. There's a narrow gate. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. Many people find that road, but narrow is the path. Few people find it that leads to life. And there are these certain worthless fellows, these useless people that Satan is constantly trying to use to lead us off of the right path of following Jesus Christ. And here Moses is saying, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. And talking about the punishment that was deserving for these people here, uh, and the punishment that was to be done to the entire city if they were led astray to worship false gods. One writer said the purpose of the harsh action was to turn aside God's anger and to seek His compassion. And they went on to say only radical and prompt action could be a remedy for the situation. Only radical action could be a remedy for the situation. When we think about the situation in which we find ourselves today in the world. We recognize that there's, there's only one radical action that could have ever been done that would keep us on the right path. There's one radical action that God took on our behalf so that we wouldn't be these people devoted to destruction. There's one radical action that God the Father took so that we would not have to be responsible to put other people to death because of their false worship. There's one radical action that God did for us, and that is there was an execution that took place of His very own Son. That execution was what appeased the wrath of God, that, that God's wrath was propitiated because of Christ's death on the cross. That the anger that God has towards sin could be appeased only by a perfect spotless sacrifice. And that was a sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. I've told you before that everything in the Old Testament is pointing in that direction, right? We might read some of these things in Deuteronomy and say, wow, that seems extreme that he wanted these people to be put to death. That was the point. It is extreme. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. 
False worship, worship of idols was serious. And the children of Israel needed to recognize how serious God took this. So serious that it led to the death of anyone that would try to lead them astray. And all of that was to point to the fact that one day there would have to be an execution that would be sufficient to cover all of our sin, that would be sufficient to appease the wrath of God once and for all. That execution took place on Calvary when Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and for mine. But even after Christ has done that for us, and even after we have made that decision to believe in what He's done and to trust in Him and to surrender our lives to Him, we still are challenged, aren't we, to keep on the narrow path, to walk in right relationship with Him, to be abiding in the vine every day, knowing that apart from Him we can do nothing, to not allow anyone in this world, no matter who they may be, what they might say, or what kind of wonders they might do, to not let anyone lead us astray from pure and total devotion and loyalty to Jesus Christ. Paul urges us as believers not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, right? Romans 12, 1 and 2. So, because that is the only way that we can live a life that is pleasing to God. One writer went on to talk about Romans and he said the the practical teaching in Romans chapters 12 through 15 shows believers what this loyalty to Christ looks like in daily living. As His redeemed and utterly secure children, it is our delight to yield ourselves fully to the Lord and to His ways. So as we look at this challenge that Moses had for the people of Israel as they were on the cusp of a new life in a new land, They were being warned here, don't be enticed, whether that's by a prophet, a false religious teacher, a family member, a close friend, a neighbor, or certain worthless people. No matter who it might be that comes your way that tries to lead you astray, don't be enticed to sin. Stay on the narrow path by being in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The Lord deserves and demands that we as His people would show exclusive loyalty to Him alone because of all that He's done for us, right? Because of all of His grace, because of what He's rescued us from, we can stay on the right path and stay loyal to Him because He's been loyal to us first. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank You for all that You have done for us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy that has been displayed for us on the cross. Lord, we recognize we live in a world that, where our enemy is, roaring, is roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And Lord, our enemy will use false teachers to try to lead us astray. Our enemy will use neighbors, coworkers, classmates, close friends, even sometimes our our nearest relatives to try to lead us astray from pure devotion to you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to stay loyal because you've been loyal to us. Help us to be faithful because you have been faithful to us. Lord, we know that left to ourselves, we will stumble and fall. So we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will keep us. You will keep us on the right path. You will protect us from the evil one. You'll help us to put on the full armor of God so that we can be protected against the, the arrows of the enemy. God, don't let us be led astray by anyone or anything in our world today. Help us to stay entirely loyal to you. And Lord, when we do stumble and fall, Thank you for the grace and mercy that you display when we confess our sins. You are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to purify us from all unrighteousness. God, I pray for all of us, but I especially think of today our young people as there's so many in the world around them that will try to entice them to sin and try to entice them 
uh, away from walking with you. Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to not be enticed by the lies of the enemy, no matter whom he might use to lead us astray. Keep us walking on the straight and narrow path. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us. Reminds me of the scene around the throne in heaven where the living creatures day and night never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And the 24 elders fall down before him who is on the throne and worship him and say, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. God bless you. Have a great week. Let's remember to stay true to the one who's been true to us. Amen? God bless you.